If you got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Revelation 8. We're going to be looking at 1 through 13. Revelation 8, 1 through 13. Today's message is entitled, The Lord's Answer to Prayer for Justice. If you know the story of Corey Tin Boom, she was a Gentile, but she was put in one of the Nazi death camps. And her family, if you recall, harbored Jews and protected them during Hitler's reign of terror during World War II, if you recall. And her and her sister went to some of these camps and were there for a very long period of time and went through some awful, awful things. And uh, eventually, as you know, the story, Corey got out of them. But Corey still struggled with forgiveness of the Nazi soldiers that did a lot of horrible things, not only to the Jews, but to them as well. And she struggled with that. She would talk to her pastor many, many times, and uh, she just having a hard time with forgiving because of what they had done. I mean, remember, they, I mean, they killed 6 million Jews, 13 million people altogether, including gypsies and anyone that didn't go along with the program. And uh, it was just a horrific time in, in her life, the Holocaust, and she struggled with forgiving. And so her pastor was talking to her one time, and he says, you know, Corey, what you're doing right now is kind of like what the guy does that rings our bells at the church. Every day he goes in there at noon and he grabs the rope and he tugs on that bell and he tugs on it to make sure that bell rings to sound at high noon. And he goes, that's what you're doing with this. He goes, your hand is on that rope of unforgiveness and you keep tugging the string and that bell keeps ringing and that rope just keeps staying in your hand and you won't let go and you just keep ringing that bell. He goes, but you got to be eventually like the guy that rings our bell, he has to let go of the rope. And the bell will keep swinging, but eventually it'll stop. And she learned a lesson from that about letting go and how to let go. And it wasn't that simple, but she finally understood what the answer is for forgiveness. She knew that she had been forgiven from God, but one of the things that haunted her and haunts us is if I let go of that rope, when do they get theirs? When do they get justice served to them? Because everybody knows intuitively, and it's biblical, when somebody does something bad to you, they deserve a punishment. Everybody knows that, and God is fair, and make sure that will happen, but it might not be in our timing. And one of the things you have to come to grips with is we understand that people wounded us, that people hurt us. We hurt ourselves. Being in the reality that we're in, the fall creates things that happen to us. We get things taken away. And we, we can deal with the fall a lot of times. We can deal with our own stupidity of making bad mistakes, and we live with the regret of that. And obviously, sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. The real issue a lot of times that people are dealing with is they can't deal with the wrongs that people did to them. They know about forgiveness. They're Christians. They know about that we should forgive, but they have a hard time doing it. They have a hard time letting go. And I'm going to tell you what part they have a hard time letting go. It's like Corey Ten Boom. They have a hard time letting go of the penalty aspect for the other person. They know the other person deserves punishment for what they did. They know that, and they want that to happen. But the reason they don't let go is because they still want to enact the punishment themselves. So to let go would mean, well, then I'm going to let them get scot-free from what they did to me. And I don't want them to go scot-free. I want them to pay. I want them to pay for the injustice they did. And so they hold on to the rope, so to speak, as Corey was doing with her, her unforgiveness. They hold on to the rope, and they refuse to let it go and give the penalty aspect over to God. God's asking us to trust him with the justice for all the wrongs in our life. He's saying, do not take vengeance into your own hands. I will avenge. Give it to me, and I will punish in my own way. 
And that takes an incredible amount of faith to give over the penalty aspect of our hurts over to God. It's very, very difficult. And so if you don't, what ends up happening to you with unforgiveness is you become extremely angry. You become extremely resentful. And sometimes you'll lose your faith, quote unquote. What I mean by that is not that you lose salvation, but you lose faith in God. Because you're asking God, well, where is this love reaping and sowing? Where are the paybacks? When do they get to lose something? Where's your justice? Why are you letting them go? How come I don't see them having any loss? That is actually one of the, the biggest profound questions in Scripture is the penalty phase for the wicked. Psalm 73 talks about that. And so we sit there and we say, I want justice. I want all my wrongs to be righted. And if it doesn't happen, I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get depressed. And things start happening to people, and it affects us. And it's amazing how it affects us. This deep-seated anger of where is the punishment for those who did stuff to me? Where is it at? Drives people to broad brush entire groups based on one person doing something to them. For instance, those who suffered the Holocaust have a hard time by broad brushing the entire German people or the entire European countries for allowing that to happen. Sometimes people will broad brush an entire race or nationality or a group because someone from that nationality did something to them. And you're seeing it right now being played out in our country with all the racial tensions, don't you? They'll broad brush the entire group for one person doing bad to them. And then if... Have you even seen this? This is kind of a weird deal, but you can understand it. Because of what some ex-spouse did to them, or the person was married before their marriage right now, and they were previously married, they end up looking at the kids and despising the kids because the kids represent the other spouse. And so they broad brush because of their unforgiveness. I've seen entire genders broad brushed by people. Entire genders, what do you mean? They'll say all men are bad, all women are bad, because someone who hurt them was a woman or a man. And they'll broad brush the entire group of the gender. I've seen people who have unforgiveness towards their authority figure that happened early in their life that hurt them, and so now all authority figures are bad. Whether it's the police or whether it's the church, whether it's government officials, they'll broad brush all authority because the authorities in their life abuse them. And if they're not careful, when somebody got hurt at church, they'll broad brush the entire church and pull away and won't even darken the door of another church in their life. Have you noticed an incredible amount of people who say they're spiritual, say they love Jesus, but don't go to church? Have you seen that one? It's more prominent than you think. The reason is probably early in their life, someone hurt them in a church, and so they, because of unforgiveness, broad-brushed all church, that all church is bad, not realizing there's a remnant and not realizing that was an individual at a particular church and at a particular time, but they'll just broad-brush everything. Unforgiveness gets you out of reality so fast it's not funny. It's crazy-making. And until we finally realize, okay, I can trust God with the penalty aspect for what people did. And guys, I know, a lot of you have lost your childhood. A lot of you lost a lot of things. These people took things from you. They wounded you deeply. They hurt you emotionally, physically, mentally, sexually, all that stuff. You lost control, and you're very angry today, and you're bitter. But you don't have to live that way. What you're about to see as we continue in the book of Revelation now is the penalty aspect of justice. It is the picture that people don't want to preach on, they don't want to talk about. In the the Joel Osteen types of churches today, this subject is not going to be talked about, but you cannot go through your Christian life 
not understanding the justice of God. Because if you don't understand the justice of a God, you won't know how to forgive. Your power to forgive comes with understanding what God does to sin and because of sin, the penalty aspect. So this helps us in balancing out how we forgive, how we love, how we move on, how we can trust God with our hurts and wounds in our life. So what you're about to see is very, very judgmental as far as what God's going to do. But it's at a period of time when humanity deserves everything they're going to get. He has given them plenty of time, plenty of grace, plenty of mercy, and now judgment is hitting. You are going to watch hell come to earth because of this. It's a difficult passage, but we'll sift through it as best we can, and it's a very Jewish passage. So I'll add that to you, and I'll talk about the Jewishness of the passage as we go. Let's go into the text, chapter 8, verse 1. And it says this, When he opened the seventh seal... Now, we have a picture here of the seals. Messiah holds the title deed of the earth. He has earned the right to the title deed by his death and resurrection. And so, to set up the kingdom, Christ must purge the earth of evil and sin. And that's what the seals represent, that each seal is broken. It opens up a series of events or judgments on the planet to cleanse the planet in preparation for the kingdom of the Messiah. Well, we're at the seventh seal, the last seal, and this last seal is broken to open up the seven trumpet judgments and then eventually the seven vile or bowl judgments. And what you're going to see is the judgments are getting progressively worse and starting to get very personal. And so it intensifies. The progression is intensifying at every turn. Let's go back to the text real quick, and it says... And there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now, I'm going to come back to this, but let me tell you what it's not. This is not some rhetorical literature device of just preparing you for the big climax. It is not a hint of a new creation, the silence before creation. It is not a psychological response. It's an extremely Jewish response. Thing. And I'll explain that in just a bit, but I've got to show you some more text to understand. This silence is for prayer. Okay? Let's move on. I'll come back to that in just a second. Let's go to verse 2. In verse 2 it says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Now, from a Jewish perspective... John writing from a Jewish perspective, writing during what's called the Second Temple Era, the time of Herod's temple, first century, the Jews, they knew who the seven angels were. You and I as Gentiles living in 2018, we don't know who the seven angels are. Well, in Jewish literature, and again, this is not canonical, this is not scripture, but this is their traditions. There were seven archangels. We know of two that are named in our scripture as Michael and Gabriel. But in the Jewish mindset, the other names of the seven angels were not only Gabriel and Michael, but Uriel, Raphael, Ragiel, Sarakiel, and Phineel. And that comes out of Jewish literature, Jewish tradition, and Jewish understanding. So when John writes the seven angels, the Jews know instantly who these are. These are the seven archangels, and they know them by name. Now, the trumpets, notice they're holding trumpets. It's not a trumpet that you would think of like in a band. It's a shofar. It's a ram's horn. And, you know, the curl at the end of it. And the ram's horn signals several things in Scripture. It signals a summoning of God's people to war in some cases, summoning God's people to worship, summoning God's people to warn them of impending danger. Sometimes it's used to celebrate, but in this context, the blowing of the trumpets, the ram's shofar horn, is to announce the defeat of a foe or the enemies of God. The typology I want you to connect this with is Jericho. This is extremely Jewish. Remember, Joshua was caused to march around Jericho how many times? Seven times and blow the trumpet, right? 
that whole picture of Joshua and the destruction of Jericho and the announcing with the blowing of the shofar of the walls coming down was a typology pointing to this event in the future. The walls coming down in this future era are the walls, so to speak, of the Antichrist system, of the one world government, that those walls that, set, that are around the whole world are going to get ready to come tumbling down by the blowing of the shofar. And so that ancient picture of Joshua marching around the walls pointed forward to this event of bringing the walls of the Antichrist and his system down, and virtually Satan, in essence, in that. So that's the Jewishness of it. Verse number 3, let's jump to that. It says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. So you have in heaven, there's a picture, just kind of get our minds wrapped around this, this heavenly scene. So the altar of incense, as you recall, and there's an angel doing this, the altar of incense was right before the Holy of Holies. It was in the holy place in the temple, but it stood right before the Holy of Holies. It actually should have been in the Holy of Holies, but because it had to be ministered to every day, it had to stay outside the Holy of Holies. Just a little background so you know about the altar of incense, because this is extremely important. The coals that were given to the altar of incense were the coals from the sacrificial altar outside of the temple, where the sacrifice of the animals would happen, and they would put the entire sacrifice on that fire, and the fire would consume it. That fire was not started by man. It was started by God, so it was considered holy fire because it came down out of heaven and lit the coals, and the priests had to keep the duty of keeping those coals and that fire going. They could never let the fire go out. Okay, so what they would do is they would shovel the coals at morning and in the evening and take them to the altar of incense and put the coals in the altar of incense and then sprinkle incense on the top. And that flavor, that smell of incense would then, with the smoke, rise up and then go over the Holy of Holies into the presence of God. If you walked into the temple or if you were around the area, you would have smelled this sweet-smelling smoke. It was a very powerful smell, but it was a very beautiful smell. That smell and that smoke represented the prayers of the saints going into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. It symbolized that. But remember, the only way those prayers would be heard is if they came from the coals of the fire of the altar of burnt offering. So again, the altar of burnt offering represents Christ's sacrifice. And the reason those prayers are sweet is because they come from the fire of sacrifice. And then the incense that's put on there is the person of Messiah who sweetens your prayers. So you have the both aspects of the, the death of Messiah on the altar of burnt offering so that those coals are being used, which points to his work. And then you have the fragrance that's dropped on the coals representing the person of Christ and making those prayers sweet to God. So in common terms, what that means is to believe in the person and work of Messiah. If you do that, then your prayers are sweet to God. He listens to them. He hears them. If you do not come by the Messiah, your prayers will simply not be heard. It's not like God can't hear them. He just won't be answered. You only have access through Messiah, his person and his work. So that's what this symbolizes right here in the picture. Okay, But this is in heaven. This is at the heavenly temple. Yes, there is a heavenly temple. There's a new Jerusalem and there's a heavenly temple. And in this heavenly temple, this is what Moses saw when he patterned the tabernacle off of that and then the temple patterned off of that. Okay, I got it, Brandon. So let's go back to the text, and I'll explain the half hour of silence in just a second. And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. There's the incense, right? Upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. The golden altar is the altar of incense. This is in heaven. And the smoke of the incense 
with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So there's the whole picture in heaven of the prayers, our prayers reaching the God, and particularly, though, a set of prayers coming from a particular group in this context. Okay, so with that being said, what's the background of this? When you marry this with the prayers from the altar of incense with the half hour, Because it says there was silence in heaven for a half hour. Incidentally, it also shows you in heaven there's a a lapse of time. It says there was silence in heaven for how long? A half hour. The only being that's eternal is God. Heaven is not eternal. Heaven is very dynamic. It changes. It actually comes to earth eventually. When people are in heaven, they experience the lapse of time. But it is a time without end. But heaven has to have time because the people there and the angels there are not eternal. And the only way we can relate to reality is if we have a succession of time. So there's, there's people in heaven experiencing time. It's a timelessness, but there is the experience of time. Nonetheless, what's this idea of a half hour in heaven? Well, it's easy. This actually comes from Jewish tradition. From the days of Solomon, when he made Solomon's temple, to the days of Herod, the tradition that started especially with the burnt offering that happened in the morning and in the evening. So nine in the morning and three in the afternoon, when the priest would come in there and sprinkle the incense over the altar, they would silence the whole sanctuary for one half hour. No one could say anything. So the whole inner sanctuary was silenced for a half hour. That comes from Solomon all the way to Herod's temple. That was the tradition believe it or not. I don't know, honestly, where they got the tradition because it's not spelled out in Scripture to wait a half hour and everyone has to be silent. It doesn't say that. It's just a tradition. But interesting enough, however the tradition starts, it's happening in heaven when the prayers are offered on the altar of incense. Well, what's happening during this time? Well, in the temple, what would happen, if you think of the temple in concentric circles... On the outside, you would have people praying on the outer courts. And then on the inner courts, you would have songs being sung. But then as you move to the concentric area around the temple, you had deathly silence. Nothing was said as far as tradition is, rabbinic tradition is, is holding to. Why? Because it was a sacred moment where God heard the prayers of the saints and would answer them. And so they silenced everything. So all the activity that's going on in heaven is silenced because a group of people are praying right now in the tribulation, and God is going to hear their prayer and answer them. What is their prayer? What are they praying What specifically has silenced all of heaven? Well, it's in Revelation 6. If you'll jump to Revelation 6 with me. When I opened the fifth seal, this is going back. Earlier in the tribulation, I saw under the altar of sacrifice the souls who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? That's the prayer that heaven is silenced for. And God is receiving these prayers from the martyred saints of the tribulation, and it's symbolized by the prayer offering of the altar of incense by an angel. And he is now about to answer that. So probably in line with this prayer request of when will you avenge, when will you punish those who killed us, when will you avenge us, now he's going to answer that. Now, a quick point of application for us before we move any further in any direction. Your hurts, your pain, the evil that people had done, has done to you in life, and probably will continue to do, that prayer request will be answered for you one day as well. He will right every wrong. He is listening to your prayer. He, the only thing he is saying is, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. But you have to trust that in the future, he will exact the punishment on that individual. Now, here's the caveat on it. 
The only way that individual who did bad things to you is ever going to get off, so to speak, is if he accepts Christ. It doesn't mean that justice won't happen, because guess what will happen? The penalty phase for that individual who did bad things to you, that if he accepts Christ, the penalty will not stop. It will just be put on Messiah. Because Messiah died for the entire world, so he took the entire wrath for every human being that's potentially available for everybody. So justice will be served, whether it's through the Messiah, by them accepting Messiah, or they will take it themselves. It's one or two ways. That's, all, that's the way it's going to come out. It's going to come one or two ways. But justice will be served. Hence, your prayers are being heard. God sees your hurt. He understands. He has said he is keeping your tears in a bottle. He is numbering them, and he promises you he will wipe away all the tears from your life because he says there's going to be no more pain, sorrow, or death or mourning in my kingdom. So I'm keeping an account. So you can trust him, not only him hearing our prayers, but delivering the punishment. Well, what's the punishment? Jump with me to verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. Notice that the censer that he has, it has the fire from the altar. The fire from the altar is from the altar of burnt sacrifice. Okay? So kind of in a representation, you can see this in your head, you have to sometimes see this, that he is going to throw the censer that's full of these coals to planet earth. Why? The coals on the altar of sacrifice represent the sacrifice of the Messiah because it represents judgment. Judgment happened to Messiah, but this planet continues to spurn that, to reject that sacrifice and have Messiah take their sacrifice, or sorry, their penalty and their condemnation. Hence, they have decided not to accept him. So God is now saying, fine. Then the wrath that I put on my son will now be put on you. And that's symbolic in the throwing of the censer of wrath to planet Earth. You don't want my son to take the wrath for you? Then you will have the full dosage of my wrath. And that's represented by the coals being thrown to planet Earth. Jesus warned about this. In John 3:36 he says he who believes in the son has eternal life, but he who does not believe in the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And that's the warning. Let's see some of these judgments. And go back to the text. And there was noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. What does that represent? It's Jewish. These are the preludes for judgment. It's going to happen. But it's also pointing to something in the Jewish Old Testament. It's pointing to Mount Sinai. It's pointing to the giving of the law. Every Jew would pick up on this as they read noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. All four are associated with Mount Sinai. Because what happened on Mount Sinai? God gave the law to Moses. But what was the law supposed to do? The law shows us that we are incapable of keeping the 613 laws. We can't do it. Messiah had to keep the law for us, right? And we put our trust in him that he kept the law for us because we fall short. We miss the target. We don't keep the law, so we need a Savior. We need a Messiah because we can't keep the law. Ah, but the world is saying, I don't want a Savior. I can keep the law. And God's saying, fine, then try it because I'm going to judge you for every penalty of the law. And hence, the idea of the noises, the thunders and lightning saying, world, you have not kept my law. You have broken my eternal law. You kill, you murder, you steal, you dishonor your parents. You make idols. You take my name and blaspheme it. You covet. You steal. You commit adultery. You don't want Messiah to take the penalty? Then fine. It's you and me one-on-one. And I'm going to judge you by my standards, not yours. That's what the rumblings are about. The world's getting ready to be judged. 
So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and hail and fire followed mingled with blood and they were thrown to the earth. The idea of hail and fire, hail represents it comes out of the heavens. It comes suddenly. It comes without warning. And it speaks of judgment coming from heaven. But notice the hell has fire with it. Fire represents wrath. This is real hell with, imagine this. Hell is made up of ice, but yet it has fire with it, and it's mingled with blood. This is a supernatural event. It cannot be explained from a naturalistic standpoint. It's an oxymoron. Fire and ice? Yeah, but God can do anything he wants, right? So this hail, it's symbolic of judgment, but notice it's blood as well. And this is basically a meteorite shower of the earth being pummeled by a meteorite shower. But this is not just some simple meteorite shower or hail or whatever it is. It is ice or even rocks or whatever it could be. It's got fire attached to it, but it's got blood attached to it. All three elements are in there. What's the blood? Blood symbolizes death. That this thing I'm about to shower on earth is going to kill people. And that is reminiscent of Egypt. Plague number seven. Remember, a hundred pound hailstones mixed with, with fire and blood came upon Egypt as well. And you think, well, that's odd. Why is there so many references to Egypt? There's a bunch you'll see Egypt and the plagues of Egypt all through this. Mount Sinai, yeah, it's all Jewish. He's sending a message to the Jews. The God of Israel is here. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his Messiah is for you. He's trying to help the Jews. So it goes, what's the result of this? It says this in the scriptures that A third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Notice, trees and grass has to do with affecting the food supply of planet Earth. The trees represent the fruit trees and things that come out of that, and the grass represents anything that domesticated animals eat, like cows, sheep, goat. Um, so, So basically, he hits the food supply with this hailstorm. And again, notice the mercy in this. The mercy is a third, not full, It's a third. That's an element of mercy. That's an element of God saying, I'm still going to give you a chance. I'm not going to kill all this food supply. I'm only going to hit a third. Would you please accept me? Would you please accept my son? We have some pictures of some forest fires. Just imagine a third of the planet being destroyed by a meteorite shower that causes a firestorm all over the planet. I mean, you've got these pictures of these forest fires. Can you imagine a third of the planet burning like this because of that it'll catch everything on fire look at this i mean these are just like in california right the forest fires that we have here imagine a third of the planet like this look at that that's just without god that's just with lightning strikes or whatnot scary but that's what's coming let's move to the second trumpet the seas then are struck verse 8 Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Again, a mountain burning with fire, and it it was thrown into the sea? A mountain with fire on it. Huh, where have I seen that one before? That's Mount Sinai. The top of Mount Sinai was burning with fire because God was there. And again, it's another allusion to Mount to. Israel, to Mount Sinai, to the giving of the law, and the earth dwellers, again, transgressing the law. And so you see this angel who calls upon this to happen. It's obviously a, probably a giant meteorite that hits the planet. You have another picture. Can you imagine something like that hitting planet Earth? And it's probably going to hit smack dab in the Mediterranean. Yeah, that's probably the best idea. Is gonna, it, this giant meteorite that they don't see coming right now is eventually going to pound the planet and and destroy a lot of the planet. Well, what happens from this? Well, it turns the oceans and and the seas into blood because a third of the sea became blood. 
Again, notice the third, which is grace. It's not happening to the entire planet, only a third of the seas. Here's a natural phenomenon that starts happening even in our seas today. It's caused by an algae. But God can do anything he wants. But this meteorite causes our waters, at least a third of our waters, to turn into blood, just like he did in Egypt. Again, there's a reference to Egypt again, turning the Nile to blood. We've got some pictures of this happening around the planet, I think. And you can see this is called red tide. And you can see different pictures of red tide that happens. Entire rivers will be like this. Imagine this happening, and it's truly blood. This is formed by an algae, by the way. It's not real blood. It's an algae. But uh, it's undrinkable. It's poisonous when the waters get like this. And it turns blood red. Again, this is a naturalistic thing that happens, but I think what you see from Scripture that it will be a supernatural event where the water consistently actually turns chemistry-wise into blood itself, which becomes undrinkable. With that being said, let's go back to the text. And it goes, And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. Well, yes, that makes sense. If you're a fish and you're in blood, you're not going to survive. So a lot of the aquatic life is now dead. And this happens a lot of times in other places around the world, in more of this red tide, but this idea of it killing the sea creatures. Most fish can't live in that. There's no oxygen. The algae is taking over, and a lot of bad stuff starts happening to the aquatic life. And there's, I think this recently happened in 2012 in China. I mean, look at the, the bottle that the guy scooped out of the river or lake or whatever he's in right now. It's undrinkable. And this is what happens to the aquatic life because of it. That's just on a natural scale right now with red algae or red tide. Just imagine God turning a third of our waters into blood and what that does to the aquatic life. There's nothing that can survive in that. And he's going to do that. He promises to do that as he did with Egypt. What was he doing? What's happening here? Why is he attacking the waters? Why is he attacking the food sources? Follow He's attacking or judging common grace. What do you mean? What's common grace? It's what's afforded to every human being that lives on the planet. That human beings can breathe air and not suffocate. That human beings are a certain distance on planet Earth from the sun where they don't freeze out or they don't get too hot. That the planet revolves in its circular orbit, producing seasons, that, they, that human beings have food, they have water. All that's called common grace, and God, what he's doing is taking common grace away. The progression in the judgments is, in the seal judgments, I'm giving you what you want. In the trumpet judgments, the first four, I'm taking away common grace that you have afforded yourself to. I'm taking that away from you. And then after that, he starts getting more specific and more personalized. That's what's happening here. And then it says a third of the ships were destroyed. And again, because of the meteorite, the ships, obviously, if it hits the Mediterranean, a lot of the shipping in that area would be destroyed. You just, you, the, whole, the whole Mediterranean would be messed up because of this, this pummeling of a meteorite. Okay, well, let's move to the third trumpet then. It gets worse. And then the fresh waters are struck. Verse 10. And then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. Again, you have this image of angels and stuff producing this. The thing about this particular star, it's not a meteorite. A lot of people misinterpret this. Yes, the first one was a meteorite. This one is not. It's a star, but not the star that you think of. And it go, let's go back to the text. And it says, And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. This is hitting the fresh water. But jump to verse 11, and I want you to notice the name of it. This is very different. The name of the star is Wormwood. That right there tells you it's not a meteorite. The fact that this star is named is a demon. 
The idea of angels in the book of Revelation are typically referred to as stars. In certain contexts, a star is a meteorite or an asteroid or something like that. But in this particular context, and what it's saying, and the fact that the star is named means that it's an angel. Just like in in Revelation chapter uh, 1, I believe, it says that Jesus holds the seven stars in his hand. And And he interprets that as the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. So stars sometimes represent angels because of the light that comes out of them. This star, because he comes out of the second atmosphere, because he comes from that to earth, that's the realm of the demonic. The realm of the demonic is space. That's their abode. And he comes out of that realm to planet earth, and the fact that he is named Wormwood symbolizes not only his name, but what he's about to do. He's about to poison the waters of planet Earth. And he does so. And again, the idea behind this is very Jewish. Let's jump to the other scripture that we have for this. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Okay, this is Jewish in referring back to the days of Moses. And every Jewish person would have picked up on this. What do you mean? Remember, once they started out of Egypt and they got out of Egypt, the first thing they came up to, and there are two million people that are thirsty for water, what happens? They come to the waters of Mara with Moses. Do you remember the waters of Mara? They were bitter. And so they went up to the waters, they're drinking the water, they're, they're in a desert, it's 120 degrees, and the water they're drinking is bitter. It probably had a high calcium and a high magnesium uh, component to it, so when they drank it, it was extremely bitter. And by the way, when you have water that has high magnesium and high calcium, you have a laxative. They got a problem on their hands, because immediately when they drank, it hit them. The bitterness flushed through them. Okay, so what did God tell Moses to do? Do you remember? He told him to throw a tree in the water, and it will purify the water. So Moses goes and gets a tree and throws the tree into the water, and the waters become sweet, drinkable. It purified the waters. What's the typology of? It's simple. It's Christ. It's the cross. The bitterness of life is made sweet, by Messiah, as they threw in the tree representing the cross, the wood on the tree, which Messiah would do the sacrifice, it cleansed the, the water, right? And they could drink and made them pure. It, the water made, was made pure, right? Oh, well, well, that's not what's happening here. No, it's the reverse. See, everything is reversing. The waters that people enjoy now are purified, right? They're drinking out of their purified water and they have their little pure, uh, purification system on their, on their tap water and whatnot. And God's saying, you've been living with the sweet water, my common grace, but because you have rejected my son, I'm going to reverse things to how they once were. I'm going to make your sweet waters bitter. You're going to now drink the waters of Mara because you refuse to throw the tree in the water. You refuse to come to faith in my son. I will make your drinking waters bitter. And I'm taking that all away. Let's go to the last point, the fourth trumpet, and the heavens are struck. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Notice all the thirds, the thirds, 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 thirds. God is now removing natural light from the sun, the moon, the stars by a third. The day is shortened. At night, they can't hardly see the moon. So something has happened to the atmospheric conditions of creating a darkness. Now, it's only a third, not a full. But what is this reminiscent of? Yes, you're right. Egypt, the plague of darkness. You got it. You've been following all the way? We continue next week into trumpets. You'll see more plagues of Egypt in this. What's going on here? You know, so he's creating darkness on the creation, and he hits the light, and he hits the energy. What's going on? What's this connection, Brandon, between this event and what happened in Egypt? 
Egypt is a typology for the tribulation. You mean all that stuff that happened to Moses that was real and, and Pharaoh and all was pointing to who? Pharaoh was a type of Antichrist. He hated the Jews. He wanted to kill them. Pharaoh represents Antichrist in the future. Egypt represents the world. All that event pointed forward. The deliverance of Israel out of the world or out of Egypt is Messiah's deliverance of Israel from the Antichrist. Moses is a typology of Christ leading Israel out of the world from the Antichrist to the promised land, to the kingdom. So when you read Moses and you read Pharaoh and Egypt, and Pharaoh's heart became hardened, so are the people, the earth dwellers, they're becoming hardened every time there's a new plague. They become hardened because they don't want Messiah. They have rejected him. All of that points forward to the Antichrist. Jericho points forward. The events that you see in the Old Testament are a typology of the final days, the last days, of Messiah rescuing Israel from the clutches of Antichrist, or if you want to call him, Pharaoh. And notice there's an interesting thing, a parallel, and the parallels go on and on and on. I don't even have time to show you all the parallels. Most people miss this. But when Moses left Egypt, it says, as a tagline, he left with a mixed multitude. And people don't know what that means. It means that the Egyptians, some of them believed, and some of them actually went with Israel and accepted the God of Israel as their God because the God of Egypt, Pharaoh, and the rest of the gods were proven to be false. And they realized that it was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, that was right. And it says a mixed multitude went with Moses. Ah, oh, Gentiles. Right. What's going on in the tribulation? It's not just simply a mixed multitude. It's an innumerable multitude come to faith in Messiah during the tribulation. You see how it points forward? It's all there. The typology is all there. It's, it's absolutely brilliant what God did. Absolutely brilliant when you see all the connections. Okay. You're going to see more of this. But here's what starts happening. This is an attack on common grace. God's saying, are you going to wake up now? I got your food sources. I got your water. You going to wake up now? Because if you're not, look what I have available. Last phrase, verse 13. And I looked and I heard an angel, or it could be an eagle angel. It's translated angel in some texts, eagle in another. I think the best translation is it's an angel that has eagle features. Okay, Flying through the midst of heaven. This is around the atmosphere of, of earth. Proclaiming to people, Saying with a loud voice, woe or oive, oive, oive. Every time you see an oive in scripture, it means a judgment is now about to happen. That's apocalyptic, cataclysmic. And notice what he says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. That's a technical phrase for earth dwellers. Earth dwellers reject Christ. People who accept Christ are heavenly dwellers. You and I look for our home in heaven. We are not earth dwellers. But the people who reject them are earth dwellers. Because the remaining blasts of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. And God is warning earth, if you think this is bad, you have no idea. Because the next phrase, I'm going to unleash, unleash the demonic on you. And I will let the demonic, who I've been holding back all your life, finally attack you personally. It doesn't get any better. It gets worse. He lets the very creatures they worship, the demonics, end up attacking them personally. And I wonder what the result will be of that. Let's do some application. Pretty heavy. I agree. That's why it's not preached. Because people want to tiptoe to the tulips and act like nothing's going on here. The book of Revelation doesn't mince any words. It says this is the way it is. Why does it do this? What's it for us? What do we get out of this? Ask yourself, 
This is the justice of God being demonstrated right in front of your very eyes and says, he's telling everybody here, this is how I'm going to deal with evil. This is how I'm going to deal with the world that continues to hurt you. This is what I'm going to do with them. Ask yourself this. Is that what I just read enough for me to forgive people? Is this enough? When God is saying, this is what I'm going to do to your enemies. This is what I'm going to, how I'm going to treat them. This is what they're storing up in wrath. Is that enough for you, Brandon? Is that enough? Or do you still want more on them? That's a tough question to ask. Because if you ask somebody that's in unforgiveness, they would say, no, give them more. Give them more. They deserve everything you throw at them, God. Everything. That's the kind of person that has not forgiven. Get them more. It's like someone shooting somebody and they're just pumping them full of bullets when they're already dead. And you hear about those crimes and they just keep pulling the trigger and then they take out the clip and put in another clip and the person's dead and they just keep unloading the bullet. And then they take the clip out and put another clip in and by the time they've shot them, they've been shot 75 times and they, the one bullet caught them. They just keep pumping in the bullets. You know why? Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. That right there, if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. That freaks me out. It really does. Because you're seeing a glimpse of what hell is like. Hell is not some party. Hell is God constantly for eternity throwing out his wrath on these individuals and it never stops, ever. And he's asking you and I, is that enough for you to give me the penalty that you're holding on somebody, is that enough for you to give to me and say, will you trust me to handle the justice in this? I just showed you how I handle it. Are you okay with that? Or do you need more, Brandon? Do you need more? Do you need me to pound them even more? And I'm going to. But I want to know if you and, you and me, Brandon, have you had enough? You have to answer that question honestly. You have to, because if you're stuck in unforgiveness of what people have done to you, you will say, give them more. And that will tell you where you're at. That is enough, it should be, to say, you're right, God, I will give you the penalty phase, and Father, you deal with them, all the people who hurt me, because you know exactly what you need to do. That's enough, Father. That's enough. We all need freedom, guys. We need freedom. And if you're in unforgiveness, you're bound and locked up and you're in a structure that you can't get out. It's your own prison. You don't need to get even. You don't need to be extremely angry and, and rageaholic. You can give that over and be free of that anger, free of that resentment, free of that bitterness. You don't have to make them pay. If you will just simply name the offense, feel what they did to you, accept the wounds, embrace it, grieve it, and then you have to do this one thing. Father, I give you the penalty for what they did to me to you. Father, I trust you with the justice of the whole situation. I trust you that you're going to make all the wrongs right in my life, whether in this life or the next, and that you will bring the bubble to center. I give it now over to you. And if you truly can do that by faith, you will be released. You will have the ability to forgive. All the bitterness and anger will melt away because you now realize God will take care of you. I pray you can do that today.